Good morning. We are having Can't Never Go today. And uh, with a very interesting information talk, I met Kent at the Mars Society Conference this year. And I thought that this information that he has compiled from many years of analysis of what is happening within space industry and technical overall uh, solutions with uh, Elon's industries, quote unquote. And uh, so I hope you will enjoy this talk just as much as Kent. Kent, welcome to AAA Houston section. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to preface this a little bit, especially with the recent controversies of this is ultimately this is this is all about Elon, but what I want you to take away from it is this is not technically about the purpose of this talk is not about Elon. The purpose of the talk is about you. What are you, what can you apply to your own career, to your own methodologies, to your own thinking about things that works with what you know you're doing now or whatever, you know, where there's something like, oh, here's basically what we're looking at is we're going into somebody's, you know, workshop. And we're looking at all their tools and their machines and so forth. And we're basically going, oh, I want one of those. And you bring it into your own, your own life. So that's kind of essentially what the purpose of this is. Um, I originally gave this talk in, um, at the Mars Society four years ago, and a, a version of it. And the blog Next Big Future picked up on it and ended up giving like all my talks at like 150 or 100 views. And then suddenly this one had 14,000 views. So, because it, you know, went viral in that sense. So I, then I went back and looked at it. I was like, oh, this is a little dated. So I decided to do an update of it. So whether he picks up on this one or not, it's relevant. It's not on YouTube yet, but um, we'll get to the end. You can pull up my slides if you like. So we're gonna take a quick look at uh, the nature of technology revolutions. Um, every technology look, revolution looks like an exponential curve. And this is what they always talk about, this whole thing about the singularity or, or back in the 1960s TV, you'd see, oh, we'll have starships by the year 1999. Well, that's because there was only 66 years that separated Kitty Hawk from Apollo 11. But what always happens with the technology revolution is it starts out looking like um, exponential growth, but it ends up in what's called logistic growth or the S curve of innovation because eventually you start, you, you've picked all the low hanging fruit and there's, there's market saturation and, and you start hitting the end of the line with all that sort of thing. Um, so what then comes along is you end up with a disruptive technology that, you know, with US launch, it was US launch was superior until the Europeans figured out a slightly cheaper way to do things. Then the Russians came along and then the Chinese and basically they were cutting on labor, but they weren't really cutting on the, the basic model of an expendable booster. And then SpaceX comes along with everything being high tech from the get go and a reusable booster. And suddenly the price of launch dropped dramatically. So um, these things, this is essentially what we're analyzing here is how did that happen? Um, we talked a little bit, this is, uh, Svetlana keeps coming back to this topic of waterfall versus, uh, versus agile. Um, Waterfall was a system mainly used from 1958 to 1998, and Agile came along, you know, roughly in the late 90s, early 2000s. But what I'm showing here on this chart is that every program from Mercury to the beginning of the ISS for NASA was firmly in the waterfall era. Um, whereas every project that Elon Musk has done, that middle chart shows the, the early Agile and then current Agile methodologies, um, everything he's ever done from, from the beginning has been in the Agile era. Uh, Agile is much easier to do with software. Uh, so there's, that's something to keep in mind is that when you're not, when you're just moving bits, you can, you know, you can invent and destroy them very quickly, just as you can thoughts. Um, so it's, it's not entirely Agile, but it is, uh, it is worth noting that the methodology is, works that way. The other thing to keep in mind is one of the things that Agile does very poorly is predicting deadlines because you're trying to, the good news is you do things as quickly as possible. The bad news is that one of the things you sacrifice is saying this will be done in three years and it actually getting done in three years. Parts of it will be done in two years. Parts of it will be done in five years. You know, so the whole thing about Elon time of everything being, you know, being late is, uh, is directly related to that as much as it is to, to his methodologies. 
Um, this is what I've broken down. I've done a lot of thought and research on what is the nature of a technology revolution. And I find these, there's five key ingredients. One is there's generally a, a higher energy density technology that comes along. So going from you know, animals to fossil fuels and to, to uh, nuclear and so forth, that's typically what happens. And then there's an affordability scale as well with that. Um, there's a convergence of different concepts coming together at the same time in three different areas or whatever that ends up exploding in the number of inventions that come out of it. So just think about radar, radio, voice communication, and aircraft. And it's more than a factorial combination. There's way, there's, I think, 32 just discrete industries built out of just those three interventions. Um, you know, science drives engineering with information and vice versa. Uh, communication drives forward a lot of these factorial expansions. Um, affordability is the efficiency of something. It's a matter of this applies to everything, but it also it's it's the number of people who can afford to start playing and how quickly they can play the game. So you get this hyper evolution of ideas that are tried, failed, and tried again, and eventually get you know you eventually build an entire ecosystem of of innovation along these lines. And then finally, excitement, because nobody wants to work on a boring technology. At the end of the day, we're all human beings. And uh, I find that most innovation can be summed up as either your superpowers, comfort, or novelty. Uh, if it doesn't touch one of, the, one of those factors, it's probably not going to succeed because nobody wants a more slow, difficult way to do something if that's what your new technology gives you. So let's, let's get on to some of the things he said directly, and then we'll get into summaries of it. Um, he makes a big deal about reasoning from first principles, which is breaking things down as far into the hard end, of, hard sciences end of things, you know, the chemistry, the physics and so forth. And uh, for example, with, with electric batteries, what's the spot price of all the commodities that go into building a battery or building a car or building a rocket. And if there's a, if there's a tenfold value add, uh, then that's an industry that's worth pursuing because there's a lot of meat on the bone when it comes to going from the raw materials to the final product. And then another thing that's thought of is the platonic ideal, the idea of, you know, Plato had this idea of what's the most perfect sphere, sphere or circle or whatever, and it was sort of a mathematical construct, but um, what does that look like in the end? So if you aim one to the other, essentially, what's, what's your platonic ideal look like versus the, the thing? And then it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's great if you have unlimited time or money, but now what? You know, so something that comes from Silicon Valley reasoning is what's called the minimum viable product. Is what's the minimum thing I can get out on the market? Because most businesses fail, so you want to get your cheapest, quickest hit out there to see what's uh, what's going to take off and what isn't going to take off. And in the case of SpaceX, literally, so the the Falcon One rocket was essentially their minimum viable commercial rocket because. Every time they launched it, they lost a big chunk of their of their uh, runway when it comes to their investment, and they almost went bankrupt on that. And the same with Tesla; they did the minimum they could to make an electric rocket, and they barely survived in both cases within a week of each other. Um, both businesses almost collapsed entirely. So, um, but once those those things mature and you get some traction and so forth, be prepared to throw out the old design. Um, the most noteworthy of this is Apple when they moved from the uh, Apple IIe series to the Macintosh series. Um, something I was unaware of at the time is that the, the Apple computer, the GS, I think, was actually superior in every way to the first generation Macintosh, but they still made the commitment to move over um, because it was the way that, you know, they wanted to start with a clean sheet of paper on all that. So the converse of that is what often happens with companies about after about a generation in, uh, we see this with a lot of the uh, aerospace companies um, going back, you know, that were big innovators in the 30s and 40s and ended up being kind of, uh, you know, more MBAs and, and risk averse in the, in the current era. Uh, they reason from analogy, which is they do what's been done before. Um, they do the minimum innovation to get a new product out there. And then they keep, they, there's a principle in accounting of basically you you keep something on the market as long as possible to basically um, get the maximum return on investment is how it's it's looked at. So uh, I think it was the president of Lockheed. I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that. But they he walked into the a board meeting and it was all there was no engineers left. It was all uh, MBAs and lawyers and accountants. And at that point, he's like, I'm done. I we're not doing anything anymore. So. 
um, that that's what one of the drivers essentially of that of that uh, log curve uh, flattening out is that eventually the uh, it's it's almost a generational thing with the people who who found them. Um, so we're going to get into some more design principles here. One one really key thing when they uh, it was during kind of a mid grade revision of the Starship. He said, you know, it took a long time to to frame the question correctly, but once we could frame the question correctly, the answer flowed from the question. Once, once the question could be reframed with precision, and he said that as as a, as a really key thing of going from from uh, composites to stainless steel with the with the Starship design, is that you had to ask the right questions up front. And the example he often gives is of of the deep thought from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy of you know you you answer you ask the question so poorly that the answer was completely meaningless of forty two, um, so that's something to keep in mind with any engineering problem. Uh, simplification, the best part is no part is the, is the quote that's getting flowed around a lot. Um, he's doing something that's kind of not really appreciated, which is what I'm just referring to as real estate minimization or, or he's with his computers, with his factories and everything, he's, he keeps taking the footprint of the factory or the, even the computer room and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And, uh, I once had a situation where I had to compress my my you know three bedroom townhouse into my bedroom, and uh, for about two months while while some work was going on, and there was a certain luxury in not having to walk that far for anything. So I think that that might be part of the mentality is that if you compact things down, the the, the flow rates just accelerate dramatically, and then uh, modularity. You know the engine it's the same engine on the Falcon One as it is on the Falcon Heavy it's just iterated many, many times. So if you can make one good thing that you can build your, your system around, that's also a, a good toolbox element. Um, he had an interview with uh, Tim Dodd, who's a YouTuber uh, by the handle Everyday Astronaut a little bit ago. And he said there was the five-step process. He said, make your requirements less dumb. Um, and, and the more authoritative the person is who give the requirements to you, the more you really need to pound them out because you know people get it. I'll get into that in moments as they they get in they get lost in their own thoughts. Um, you know, delete part of the, part of the processes. Uh, you know, try to if you aren't forced to add things back in, you're not cutting enough, and I, that's true in any endeavor process software. I mean, you know, one of my day job things is is business process model notation, and you'll end up with a you'll come out of a meeting with a you know a fifty step process of how things are done now. And then when you start accelerating it, you're down to 30 steps typically. Um, you simplify or optimize what's left. You know, as I said, you you take what's once you simplify it down, it's like take the things that are left and try to to optimize those a bit, and then accelerate the cycle time. Um, going back to the whole, you know, Scrum versus uh, or Agile versus waterfall. He said a high production rate cures many ills. In other words, if you made a slight mistake in the last one, it's like okay, don't dwell on it. Get fix it and move on to the next and then don't let that let that mistake creep back in again um we saw this a lot in uh, in world war ii manufacturing and things like that where they would um they they got the basic thing done but then they had a whole stack of innovations they put onto it and so they would they they would build a, they would take them like you know x amount of hours to build a plane and then they put an equal number of hours into all the modifications to that plane to get it up to spec so it's like they were building a plane twice. Now, in a way, it was wasteful, but it was the only way they could do it, you know, in, in the 1940s, because every time they tried to fix something on the assembly line, they would have to shut down the assembly line. So if they fixed everything up front, they would not, they would not have built anything because they would constantly be down for, for revisions. So the only way they could do it was build a minimum plane, fly it somewhere else, fix all the problems on it, and then fly it off to, to combat. Um, you know, so one of those two approaches is kind of how you have to deal with things depending on what you're actually doing. Um, and then finally automate what's left as best you can. Um, and then he said, the other thing is if you've got test steps in a problem, remember to remove them after you, after you verify you fix the problem because you'll have, especially with software, you've got a lot of code in there that's just, please don't let this happen again sort of thing. Um, now, one thing that happened around the time I was watching this is I just was randomly going through and I found a, a stage magician doing a TEDx talk where he was talking about how to solve how magicians do, do uh, magic tricks. 
And I found a lot of the same arguments being used. It was, you know, the whole thing of make your requirements for us dumb. He was saying that a lot of people have their, their mail. A lot of what a magician does to do a trick is they're doing, they're taking advantage of your mental shortcuts on how you see things and, and how the cards are stacked or, or whatever. And they're shortcutting that by going in a different direction, just behind, you know, they may be doing it right in front of you and you don't see it because your, your brain doesn't let you see it because you're used to seeing things the same way. So it's much harder to fuel children when you're doing stage magic than it is intelligent adults. And the more intelligent the adult, the more, uh, the more easier they are to fool. And the reason for that is they've got a lot more scripts in their head of this is how I reason from analogy because I've done so much and I've, you know, they've done the thing a hundred times and they've done a hundred things a hundred times as opposed to 10 things, 10 times. So once you can take advantage of the fact that their brain is going to go in a particular direction, if you go in an unexpected direction, then you've done the magic trick and they're fooled. Um, so there's a lot of that in physics. There's a lot of that in, in engineering where if you, can kind of draw a balance between um, not seeing the same thing every time when, especially when a result goes differently than you expect uh, to essentially kind of peek behind the curtain of what's going on. Um, as I was writing this, I was realizing that there, there's three kinds of magic shows. It's the one where you've already figured out all the tricks and those are kind of boring passive entertainment. There's the one where you figured out every trick or you, you can't figure out any of the tricks. Well, that's also passive entertainment because you've given up. But in the middle are all those tricks where it's like, I figured out, like I went to a, one in magic show, the last one I went to in person, I could figure out about half the tricks and half the tricks were completely outside of my game. And that was the most, in, most entertaining because my brain was engaged the entire time. So try to find those things that, you know, in your, in your path where, you were at least halfway mystified so that there's always something more to do and you're at least halfway engaged where, you know, you've got that flow in between the two extremes where you're mentally engaged in every piece of what you're doing. Um, this was a talk called Battery Days when they talk about, here's all the innovations we're putting in Tesla batteries. And they, they had a goal that, they, that everything came back to, which was we want to cut the cost per kilowatt hour in half of the batteries. And they didn't find one magic bullet that solved all the problems. They found incremental things. Some only falls like 7% or 5% of the problems. Those weren't failure because when you stacked all those innovations together, um, you know, and again, these, these go back to the principles of what everybody does when they're making lithium uh, batteries, they dissolve all the lithium in a, in a liquid. They put it, they spread it through the thing and then they dry the liquid out. So they're using the liquid adding, you know, running the process and then getting rid of the liquids. Like, so they found a way to just make it a powder and get rid of all that, that process because why, why bother if you don't have to? You're just getting rid of it at the end anyway. So again, back to simplification and so forth. Um, they're also compressing the, the factories down and so forth. So, um, but in the end, the, all these incremental things, they actually exceeded the target. They shot for 50 and they ended up with 56%. And they, they did a lot of what's called vertical integration where you know once you start bringing all these things in the house, you don't have to wait for somebody else to do something. Um, one of the reasons their engine technology advanced as quickly as it did was because they ended up with, um, they, they built their own engine test stand very early in the process. So they didn't have to schedule time on a NASA test stand, they could just go and do it. Um, and whereas if your competitors are all scheduling time on somebody else's equipment, no matter what it is, uh, they, they are not going to accelerate as quickly as you are, even if everything else is exactly the same. Um, so the other AI day had two major announcements was the Optimus robot. They, they brought out one they called um, Bumble C. I'm not, Bumble, I'm sure it's a reference to Bumblebee uh, from the Transformer series, but it basically they took off the shelf parts and they threw something together and it was able to walk and move. And it was slow. I mean, it moved like, you know, a 90 year old person in a, in a home, but it was able to, to do things like, you know, water plants and so forth. And the other thing that was amazing about it to me was that when they showed the AI vision of it, it was extremely basic. Like it would, in terms of, it was already simplifying the problem down to where, you know, you could just look at the screen and say, oh, it's do a white, you know, ABC. But to get there, you had to do a ton of visual processing, which is something where they're, they're using the same computer they're using with all the visual processing on the Tesla 
self-driving and where it's and they compress that down into a robot that's working you know inside a house or an office or a factory so um they want to have this thing down to twenty thousand dollars they want to build millions of them and they want to have the first one where you order it and you can actually take delivery in about three years now you know with agile that's going to be closer to five years but the fact that even such a thing is possible um is is rather instructive um so the other part that they talked about was their what they call the dojo which is their their learning center and what this basically boils down to is if you are driving a tesla it is i i believe even if you're not using the self-driving feature it's still trying to game the problem like a, like a co-pilot and see what it would do in a certain situation and if you do something different it considers that an exception and it sends it back to the server and basically it says okay i would have done this the driver actually did this other thing this other thing worked did I, was my innovation wrong and uh so they have a whole lot of things built around that and a whole lot of things built around visual recognition of, oh, that's a person walking a dog. You know, they're going to behave differently than somebody who's uh, jogging or somebody who's pushing a wheelchair or whatever. And it tries to anticipate based on what it's seeing, what's going to happen next, which is very interesting because they, they said something that they kind of threw it away. And it was like, it was the most amazing thing was they said they tried using visual algorithms for this and it just hit a wall so they started using linguistic algorithms which is essentially what we do when we're compressing information down to speech what i'm doing right now it's all a one-dimensional string of words that could carry anything from you know poetry to plasma physics but it's compressed down to this one-dimensional string of words so it seems like you know they didn't say it outright but it implied that they were doing something like that where it's like if you see a guy doing this it's going to do except in computer language and they showed a mathematical formula which i thought was was hilarious because one of the factors in the thing of predicting what was going to happen and deciding what would happen was a variable for ego and so it's like is if i do x is this other driver going to be because they would actually flash the car red if the car had to stop it's like, am I going to offend that driver or get, you know, potentially read to a road rage or something? So it was, it was fascinating in that regard that, that that was put into the mathematical formula of I'm not going to do this because I'm going to, you know, make enemies or whatever. Um, but they've in in the process, like I said, they're they're going to have about a 14-fold expansion of, of capacity in their ability to label objects, roughly in the same time frame that that Optimus robot is being built. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind is that that's going to be um, something that's, they're going to have both outdoor labeling of things that they see on the street with the thing and indoor labeling of, you know, this is a laptop, this is a, this is a dishwasher, whatever. Um, this is just a brief interview he did with, uh, he had Jay Leno out and he said that there was, he made a kind of interesting comment of patents are for the weak, they're like landmines and warfare. They keep other people from following you, but they don't advance anything. And they actually gave away a lot of their patents, which in a way legitimized their, their technology base with Tesla because there's, there's an old maxim, two is one, one is none. And if you don't have competition who pulls, who, you know, moves things up the, uh, the uh, not just the diffusion of innovations curve, but basically the marketing curve, is if you only see one company doing something, do you invest in it? And the answer is, well, if it was good, other people would be doing it too. So by giving away their patents to, to a lot of other companies early on in the process, it was like, well, it must be good because there's electric cars from a bunch of different manufacturers. And then when you compare them all, it's like, and then you end up buying a Tesla anyway, you're, you feel safer in that decision because you don't, there's, you know, the, you know, the, the safety and numbers quality of, of human logic that tends to affect, especially about well, 80% of the curve to some degree and 20% of the curve entirely when it comes to uh, marketing things out, you know, the late, late adopters versus early adopters. And then another thing that came up was uh, he, since he has the automotive industry is very good at manufacturing. Um, a lot of the industry, I'm reading a book now called Freedom's Forge about how all the industrial capacity in World War II in the United States, where we were just cranking out weapons like crazy, not just for the US, but for Europe in general, um, and 
was based on the fact that we'd figured out a lot of things in the early automotive industry that then we applied to aircraft and, and everything else. So if you got really good at manufacturing and then aerospace is really good at material science, and then some of the materials end up in the cars and some of the manufacturing techniques end up in the aerospace, then you've got this, it's a diffusion of innovations in, in uh, convergence of the manufacturing process itself, not just in the end, end unit of the manufacturing. It's innovation in the machine that makes the machine. So uh, you, by having those elements together, you have that. And uh, Mike Griffin did a talk where he was talking about the fact that NASA and DARPA were like, it was almost like a left leg, right leg advancing technology because NASA was really good at the material side, but they didn't do a lot of units of production. You'd make, um, I had a conversation with a guy where uh, he was working on one of the early Mars rovers. And he said, we had the same problem. I worked at McDonald's corporate on the hardware side and he worked on these Mars rovers and we both bought the entire world supply of the thing. In our case, we bought 14,000 of a particular rack and he got, his case, he bought three of a computer part. It was the same problem because we we had, we were hitting the limits of the industrial capacity. It's just one was a much higher number. So with the military, you had the ability of, we're doing the same thing over and over again, but we have to mass produce it. So once, you, once you've got the, the innovation of the initial invention and the production process of, the, of DARPA combined, you ended up advancing technology, which spilled over into the microcomputer revolution and, and other, other innovations along those lines. So these, we're going to get into some more consolidated analysis now. Um, I think at this rate, we're gonna be about 45 minutes just for reference. Um, a guy named uh, Dan Rasky did, did a series of videos on YouTube. And what he was, is he was a NASA engineer who was embedded with SpaceX as part of the Dragon cargo program. And he was doing exactly what we're doing now. It's like, take those innovations from SpaceX and bring them back to NASA and, 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 uh, and take whatever NASA knew from you know, decades of design heritage and bring them into SpaceX. And he was amazed at one thing where NASA, you would do, you'd have at least an 80% chance of success with the thing. And you, you spent the amount of money that it need, needed to get that when you did a test. With, with uh, SpaceX, they'd have a meeting. It's like, okay, there's a 51% chance of this thing working. Go ahead and do it and do it in a very um, sparse way, like 80-20 rule. If, if you can get 80% of the answers with 20% of the investment, that's, that's your borderline. But they ended up doing a lot more experiments in a lot shorter period of time. So you ended up with curves with many more data points, even if the quality of those data points was a bit rough. But once you had those rough data points, you could then iterate the design process of the, not just the production, but the experiment itself. So they ended up building, going from nothing to the most advanced thermal protection system factory in nine months. Uh, most advanced in the world, and that was for cargo dragons. So with crew dragons, it's a different technology, and with Starship, it's yet another technology. So, you know, if you take this 51% versus uh, the 80-20 rule, you end up with something that it, it wouldn't matter how much NASA spent on testing. It would still fall behind after, you know, three or four years of the same, same process. Uh, simply because it's, it's the innovation out accelerates the spending on the process. Um, one second. So another thing they do is what's, what's I, they have a, an element that concentrates the talent pool is that, uh, and, and NASA to some degree, I mean, NASA on a resume is a particular thing, but um, you know, there's a thing called Price's Law where 50% of the work is done by the square root of the team size. So the bigger the team size, the more people are doing almost nothing towards the actual goal. And I've been on both ends of that. I've been, you know, the back of the line where you're just trying to keep the, you know, keep the lights on and then the front end where you're, you're at the point of the spear. And they're both necessary in their own way. But um, what SpaceX does is because they know they're going to be working long hours, um, you tend to weed out the people who don't want to work, you know, 60, 80 hour weeks and so forth. So if you, if you're working, you know, and Musk leads by example, he works, you know, uh, you know, hundred hour weeks, roughly, I think it was something ridiculous like that. Um, so when you do that, you end up with kind of a squaring of the, 
not only the talent of the people involved, but the productivity they're doing in the number of hours of doing it. So just on these two things, you end up with a, with a nine-fold increase in productivity by per engineer on a project. Um, and then another thing that's not really appreciated is that there's something called the OODA loop, which originally goes back to fighter pilot, which was observe, orient, decide, act. And you go through this loop as fast as you can, because being a fighter pilot is the fastest innovation thing, because you're in a jet, your life is on the line, you better make quick decisions. Um, otherwise, you're not going to come out of it. And generally with any game, whether it's marketing or chess or or, or anything, the person who goes through the loop fastest has a much higher probability of, of succeeding. So what happens when you have three engineers doing the process that one space engineer would do? You have to have meetings, you have to have feedback, you have to report, you have to have, and then you, if you say something, you have to make sure that, that what you said was interpreted correctly or, or possibly better than what you intended. And then understand that that's been done. So you end up putting a lot of uh, uh, fire breaks in the, in the acceleration curve just by having three engineers doing the same thing. Um, so, you know, it's, there's yet another accelerator there essentially. Um, Peter Thiel, who's uh, worked, he worked with him on uh, PayPal and then he's gone on to do a number of uh, interesting operations himself. But uh, he wrote a book called Zero to One about starting with nothing and ending up with an innovative company. And he broke all of the problems down to uh, this, what he, uh, this, these questions. And so it's the engineering question, the timing question is, is how I was denoting it here. Um, that tenfold breakthrough in technology is, is what I went through with the first principles of if the material costs are one tenth of the price of the material, then of the finished product, then you've, you've got a lot of room to play with on the value add. Uh, what's the timing of starting your business? Um, will you have a big share of a small market, uh, at least to begin with? Um, do you have the right team? We just went through that. Um, do you have a way to create, but not, not only create, but deliver your product? Now with the internet, that's easy if what you're delivering is information because it's essentially free. But when you're delivering material products, of course, it's a lot more complicated. Um, durability is like, will your position still be defensible You know, 10 to 20 years in the future? Uh, and again, that goes back to acceleration. And then have you identified a uh, unique opportunity that others don't see? And this goes back to the magic trick element of things of, of, do you see something that other people, because they're reasoning and even the most intelligent people will not see it. And they're actually less likely to see it because they're, they've got so much software in their head of how to get things done that when you innovate something that is not in that pattern, um, it falls through the cracks and they don't, they don't even perceive that it's happening until it's already you know, become a new process. So if you, basically, if you start it, if you have a business idea and you put those rules to it and it still passes all those tests, you have a much higher probability of success. And if it isn't passing those tests, you have a much higher probability of finding out where, where it's broken and where you can fix it and, and, and pivot the idea. Um, so I broke this down into, um, basic lessons here. And the inception, he reasoned from first principles. This is what he did when co companies were starting. Um, started with an ideal concept, attracted the best people. Then there was an establishment phase where he was vertically integrating supplies and production, um, modularizing products and, and optimizing factories. And then acceleration is, you don't have to go where the, the best people are. You can build something in the middle of nowhere and the best people will come to you. You can't start there because nobody, you know, if, if you if you build it, they won't come because there ain't nothing to come to if you're building, you know, uh, a factory in the middle of nowhere. But if you build the factory where the talent is, and then you bring the talent in, and then you've you've established yourself like he did with uh, with Tesla and SpaceX being in Los Angeles, he was in the middle of a bunch of companies in the aerospace industry, as it were. Um, and actually, even Boca Chica is close enough to Houston that there's probably some cross pollination there. So, um, and then, you know, scale the automation and so forth to where it's, there's, you're so far ahead of the crowd that there's no way anybody's going to just blindside you until you've reached your asymptotic limits. And then, um, like I said, start with bits and then atoms because, you know, information is relatively free if you were a startup doing software. Um, you know, follow the established talent, build your, that's what I was just saying about that. And then, um, then move that trail into places where it's cheaper to buy land and so forth, like they're doing with, with Giga Texas and so forth. Um, 
So challenges and competition, I love this quote of, we, we convert the impossible to late. Um, so this was a thing I came up with a few years back on what I call the grand challenges of space settlement. And when I originally created this chart, it was, everything was black. There was no, nothing being done. It was like, first we have to, if you think of this like a periodic table, it's like, first we need to crack the problem of affordable launch, you know, and then large vehicle launch. If we can't do that, we got nothing. So this was, um, you know, in the, this was kind of what Constellation was originally supposed to be. And then mass fraction bond Earth orbit, that goes back to orbital refueling and so forth. So what SpaceX has done is anything in, in green here, they've at least considered the problem. And I know that, has he really solved the problem of solar flares? Well, having a really big spaceship will kind of solve that for you because you have room for shielding and so forth that you wouldn't have on a, on a small capsule. Um, so, but there's all these other, you know, uh, breaks to step on where let's say they land uh, the lunar starship on the surface of the moon, but there is no good functioning spacesuit for doing surface exploration. Uh, what then? Do you, do you delay the landing or do you build the suit? Um, so there's, there's a lot of things like that where you know, they're not, because of the Agile methodology, they aren't necessarily looking as far down the road as NASA has to with their roadmap. So this is where the two, again, left, right, left leg, right leg, you've got to be able to think ahead of the problems. And then uh, this goes back to the whole, uh, you know, it's, it's also called the underpants gnome thing, because this, this originally came up with Jeff Greeson is like, how do you get from you know, early innovation to, to having a, an interplanetary, you know, ecosystem of, of economy factors. So uh, in conventional innovation, it's called the valley of death. If you, you're spending a lot of money, but you're not getting anywhere. Um, so with SpaceX, this, this Starlink constellation is largely a business model to get through that for uh, Mars exploration. And in the end, they could have a budget the equivalent to $14 billion off of just that, which is the equivalent to as much as NASA spends on space, um, or at least back in the shuttle era. So it's, it's interesting in that regard is that he's got something in place to do that. However, Starlink itself is not generating profit yet. It's a lot of satellites, but until those terminals pay for themselves and until those subscriptions pay for themselves, you know, you have to, he's got to get that going ahead of the uh, game. And then, uh, so this is just a comparison to its nearest competitor. They've grown at the same rate, but not at the same, you know, results. Um, I think that from what I've seen of, of Blue Origin, they are, they are functioning like an asymptotic company, even though they're supposed to be an innovative company. They're, they're way too locked down in uh, the legal and the HR and things like that. They're not worried about their they they don't want to talk to anybody they're just they're kind of in that they're stuck in that analysis paralysis rut as well as the the things that happen to companies when they're um when they're essentially close to it, the equivalent to what your what happens to your career when you're about five years short of retirement um is already happening at blue origin and they haven't even really started yet so that's kind of tragic because they're they have so much potential and they're you know it's all brand new facilities and you know, but they're not working, you know, it, it worked against them in a way because they, they, they tried to follow an older pattern and an established route and they got stuck in the same ruts as everything else. Um, so um, history and precedent, uh, ironically lucky, the, the, a lot of these principles go back to the skunk works and, and putting the engineers in the factory in the same place and things like that, that goes straight back to the SR-71 and things like that. And then another interesting analogy I have is, like I said, I'm reading this book on World War II production, and they have, if you compared the way they build a battleship in World War I, where it might take six months to build one ship, to the way they welded together the Liberty ships, and they built them on an assembly line much as you would a car, and they were cranking out a ship, and in, in the fastest they cranked out a Liberty ship was five days. Now they ended up spending two weeks at, at sea fixing, you know, doing the sea trials and fixing everything. So it wasn't five days to a completed 100% ready ship, but that ship was still in service in 1953. So they, did it, they didn't just build it and sink it, they built it for real. So when you see them go from, you know, 
these bespoke things like the, the as I said, the, it took the same amount of time to build the Saturn V. And there was a lot of bespoke things of how it was built in terms of the, no two engines were exactly the same and so forth. Versus, you know, this assembly line process where everything's just welded in a hurry um, that's being done with, with uh, SpaceX is that you're, they're talking about cranking out one every, every week or so. So you've got exactly the same time frame and roughly the same, you know, a, a 20 year difference in one case, and a 50 year difference in the other, but still it's, it, you see the trend lines are, are, are consistent there. So that's, that's the end of my, my talk. There's a, if you wanna go see like a list of, if you scan that and go to the website, there's a lot of, um, you know, basically talks I've done for the last uh, 14 years. And if you wanna see things like, here's a, here's a Mars city and here's how to do paraterraforming and then other thoughts on how you accelerate technology and, and technology revolutions, those are all there. So um, let's see, I will pop things out a bit. And uh, any questions? I don't, I don't see a chat window here. I'm not sure what's going on. I think it's because I'm presenting. Hmm. I don't see where the chat window is. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me stop. There's no questions in the chat. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, so let's see. So everyone, if, if you have a question, uh, uh, please uh, either just open your mic. I, I did mute a few a few of you during presentation, so it wouldn't be distracting. Oh, there it is, okay. Okay, I see actually, I see one. Yeah. yes, one from Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, please spell out that acronym because I'm not, uh, like I said, I don't. Bill, un unmute yourself and explain what you mean. Hold on, I will. I will unmute. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. There we go. Okay. okay. There's something a Russian scientist did about 50 years ago. He studied a bunch of patents and found there were some principles of innovation that had to be solving some innovate uh, some contradictions. So, example, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of uh, uh, YouTube and open source in this idea TRIZ. TRIZ stands for some Russian name, but somebody knows what it is. I don't. But uh, one example is in their in their open source information is that one example of a conflict is a uh, contradiction is you're driving a pile. You want to be sharp so you can drive it easily. Then you want to be dull so that it doesn't keep sinking. So you want something that's sharp and dull at the same time. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. You fill it with cement, you have little wings on it, but something you might check into it's about innovation and it might fit into this concept. Okay, and then uh, do you have any other source material around that or? Uh, or just can, look up the acronym. I can look up on. Uh, I'll, I'll say I'll put a link in the chat in just a minute. Oh, okay. Okay. I just did. It, it is not okay. the Russian, but uh, yeah, I just did it, and it stands for Theory of Innovative Problem Solving. And uh, sh where is that? Okay. Oh, okay. Trees. So it started in Russia, but it doesn't sound well. I'm Russian. It doesn't sound Russian at all. And uh, I think it, it's actually what they did, they converted the English word, which is trees, and into a, a Russian pronunciation. And so it uh, ended up to be um, a losing, but it is a sort of find, finding a solution in the forest, almost uh, like a, the machine learning, the random trees, random forest. Well, the, the term is uh, the the, colloquialism it's probably referring to is you can't see the forest for the trees and so that's probably what that's based on then is that but uh yeah i'll look that up in a bit um thank you I, like i said i a lot of this i'm self-taught on and i it's like i read a book i analyze analyze it and if you do that enough you end up being you know well in my case the steering committee chair of the mars society but uh, this this started out as a hobby that took on a life of its own but hasn't made any money yet um, so um, Ellen, you've got your hand. Oh, let me let me read the question here. Um, to what extent is innovation correlated with organizational courage? Um, can that be developed? If there's a lack of courage, there's a, there's an issue, but there's also a lack of. I think that one of the issues 
as well is that if you get an organization where people are not, um, if you, you know, typically there's the, the old expression of the, uh, you know, the, the rookie and their, their rookie mistakes and so forth. My, I had a friend in, in college who was an intern as programmer. And when he first started out, he was nicknamed uh, the third string bean hot dog. And then he did something really innovative and they appreciated it. And so it's like, you're not, you're no longer a string brain, you're a sprout. Um, so he was rewarded for innovation, but when he originally came in, he was the, oh, you're, you're nothing. You just have a lot of ideas, but you have no accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the flip side of that is I remember another guy at a software company where it was like, he'd, he'd talk to somebody who's 23 and they'd say, and he was, they, they did video games and it was like, you know, the, oh, I need you to do the explosion effects for this video game. It's like, oh, I don't specialize in explosions. And he was like 40 at the time. And he just looked at the guy. He was like, you're 23. You don't specialize in shit. <laughs> it's just, it's not, it's like you are too far, far too early in your career to, to say you specialize in anything. It just means you've only got one skill set. Now, if you, if you expand that, you'll do better. But if you, you know, go on that. So it's, there's no one answer to the question of organizational courage. I think you need to be if people are frequently being shot down um, or if their boss is basically feel, fearing competition, it's the old thing of A-list people hire A-list people, B-list people hire C-list people. If your boss is a B-list person or you've got a lot of B-list uh, layers in an organization that are worried that an A-list person is gonna come and, and steal their promotion they've been working for five years towards, then you're gonna have an issue there. So. Yeah, it's it's there's no one answer to that. It's gonna you have to play your own game as it is. Um, so I hope that's reasonably acceptable. It's just it's realistic. I think it's that you've got to, you know. I I remember one woman who she kept coming up with these innovative things at work, and her boss kept shooting them down. And her boss was supposed to be in charge of innovation. And I said, your boss is not letting you innovate, and that's your job title. So what is her job? What is her real job title? It's it's like what's the opposite of innovation? It was it was it was the leader of stagnation, is what how I put it at the time. Um, so, okay, okay, I I will look up those. I'll scrape those down and, and look that up later. I'm sure that'll be a talk in the future. Um, so, Ellen, you had your your hand up, and I didn't. Uh, I was just dealing with one in the chat first. So. I took the uh, Google course they had a while back about how the self-driving uh, car works. And you mentioned in your presentation that they process a lot of data and it's because that's how it works. They have, camera, it, they have cameras and it, they take a lot of images and then they use stochastic probability to predict, uh, to understand the environment and decide how to move the car, or also probably this new Omni, Omnicron robot or any of these robots or self-driving cars would, would probably use all these images combined with stochastic probabilities. So when you mentioned the fact that um, there's an ego factor, it triggered a thought for me. You know, as part of the uh, the automotive, um, you go to get your driver's license, you know, you're not, not even commercial, just a standard driver's license for a car. They tell you something really important. They say, don't um, expect the other driver to yield. You yield because there's that ego factor. People will think that the other car will, will yield to them. And you can reduce a lot of accidents by just yielding. You know, if you think that person isn't going to yield, yield. So that's probably why they have to have that ego factor in there. Because even after the robot or the self-driving car has pulled in all that image data and then used stochastic probability to figure out what it should do, it has to factor into the fact that the other, whatever it is that it's encountering may not yield. So that was really interesting. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't thought to put the two together, but I just had that thought and I thought I'd share. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I, I'm, I'm generally a polite driver. I mean, I, I, I noticed an interesting factor is if I, if I had a choice between buying one vehicle and another vehicle, and then I'm driving that vehicle for the next five to seven years, what did that do to my brain? Because I, I drove a hybrid, which was not a race car, but before that I drove a race car. And then it's like, there were times where it's like, I wanted to get an SUV and I didn't. And it was like, 
if I'd gotten that, would I do more stuff outdoors? Would I do more biking, you know, things like that, just to justify the expense? And how would I be, would I be 10 pounds lighter now if I had an SUV? You know, things like that. It was like, because I was biking or whatever. And so there's a lot of that sort of factor involved, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I went to the Philippines recently and the guy that we had as our driver was a race car driver in his other profession. And he drove, he was picture a limo driver for a politician because that was his other thing is he was, he would drive politician stuff around. So he was very highly rated as a limo driver. But, you know, driving literally 100 miles an hour down the road and, and dodging, you know, and it's the Philippines. So you're dodging bicycles and chickens and everything. And he had to replace the corn in his car three or four times because it was like, because he was leaning on, it was like, beep, 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 beep. It was like the whole trip was one long you know, honking and get, forcing his way through traffic. And it was just such a completely different mentality of how I would drive. And it worked. I mean, we got where we were going and we, we made it to the airport on time and everything like that. But it was just like, uh, and then doing hairpin turns and mountain roads with, you know, all the stuff. And it was like, you know, it was a completely different mindset that I would not want him driving Tesla because it was like, that would end up part of the album. <laughs> So, uh, but, you know, at the same time, I'm like, I have not driven like this probably at all, but, you know, the the branch of us and in, in the evolution of our driving styles probably diverged from when I was in my 20s. It's like, it was interesting to see what happened over there. It's like, so if I was ever in a situation where I had to like get out of, you know, get through something in a hurry, it was like, oh, so this is how he's doing it. Um, I was like looking at the bubbles of what was the safe zone for the car to go into. And it was way outside the range of what I would do, but it was, but it was, it worked. We got where we're going, but uh, Katya, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ken. It was really interesting um, talk. Um, you mentioned a couple of uh, historical analogies and I wonder, um, have you looked also into Henry Ford's um, autobiography? For example, I was reading, um, actually I was listening to the um, audio book of his actually 100 years old um, mm -hmm. uh, autobiography and talking a lot about innovation and manufacturing. And um, I started to think about how much uh, Elon works is actually very um, compatible um, uh, with what uh, Henry Ford was saying. And he's got his principles around innovation and manufacturing and actually 100 years old. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I do. It's uh, there's. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because that's that's like a. It's not really a gap in my understanding, but I I'm going through a book called Freedom's Forge, and it's about all the innovations that came out of the automotive industry and went into uh, building the uh, industrial complex in World War II, and the guy who was responsible for a lot of that was a guy named Bill Knudsen, and he picked up where Henry Ford left off. Because what Henry Ford did was he built the, the assembly line, but even he didn't invent that. That, that goes back to um, early, there was the first assembly lines with interchangeable parts goes back like two generations before that. So it's, it's like, if I, if I scan up a bit, see that, that collection of books up there is called The Great Conversation. And that's like everything going all the way back to Plato and all the way up to, I think the last ones are, you know, are, uh, like Freud and Marx and all that in 20th or 20th century philosophers. But it was this conversation of, I have this idea, no, I have this idea, no, I, going up back like 3000 years of human history. And um, we see that in, in the technology revolutions. So this issue with Bill Knudsen and his stuff in, in, from 1935 to 1945 roughly is the continuation of the conversation that started with Henry Ford during the Model T era and stuff like that. Um, but Ford did a few interesting things that were way ahead of his time. And then I, I would also uh, recommend you read uh, Mover of Men and Mountains by uh, R.G. Letourneau, and it's his autobiography. And he was the guy who had almost 300 patents and he invented the, basically the bulldozer, the offshore oil drilling platform, the, the biggest land vehicles ever made, mostly in earth moving. He created, he invented the bulk of the uh, earth moving equipment that was used in World War II by the U.S., um, and hardly anybody's heard of him because he was kind of in that gap where unless you, unless you see the technology every day, you don't know anything about it. Um, so 
in the end, you have this, what Henry Ford did was he had, he was relatively uneducated and they were, they brought him into a thing where it was like, you probably know the story. It was like, he would basically say, how can you know this? And how can you know that? And whatever. And he had a panel of buttons on his desk where he could push a button and bring in an expert on engineering or another person on, on logistics or whatever. It's like, why would I have to know this? I can push a button, bring somebody into my office in 10 minutes, get the answers and then move on. And it's like, he was doing a Google search in the 1930s because he could. And then something R.G. Letourneau did was he had his factory on site. So it was like, if I, have an, if I sketch out a hook that I think can lift 20 tons on my desk at eight in the morning, I want to see it lifting 20 tons after lunch. Because they could take the sketch, transfer it to a sand mold, pour the steel, cast it, hang it on a thing, put a 20 ton load on it. And by after lunch, he would, he would immediately have that test data saying that was a good design for a hook. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very interesting conversation. Thanks. But one of the things technology gives us nowadays, going, going back to the you here now mm. application of this, is that the technology that cost millions of dollars in the 1930s or 1960s is in this laptop sitting in front of you right now. So what are you doing with it, you know, as opposed to what they could do with it? Um, you know, that's kind of how I started with this whole thing is I just did a lot of, I, I won a competition to design what would have been, it's the Earth Return Vehicle, which is the, the forerunner of Starship um, in 2004. And uh, that was, a, it was relearning all that stuff off, off web searches and, and rechecking my math eight, eight ways to Sunday because I hadn't done it in so long, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm seeing Thanks, more questions in the chat. So let me let me scroll down here. This is the role of financial brinksmanship in each Elon venture. Um, many companies are willing to get into this car or launch has to work or we close the doors. Um, brinksmanship implies you're going against somebody other than yourself. In this case, I think he he was he was racing bankruptcy more than he was he was, he was in a race with his own wallet as opposed to in a race with a competitor at that point. Um, so I think every startup goes through that to a degree because you have a, a factor which known, what's, it's called burn rate, which is you start out with this much money and then you end up, you either end up with a product or you, and a profit or you end up with zero at the end. If you get to zero, you're done. Uh, so you try to either find something that works or you pivot off to something else that works or you try to raise more capital or you try to cut expenses. So really every startup is in a, in a case of brinksmanship. The fact that he got all the way to the end of the curve before he um, turned it, um, right. you know, I think that was a matter of, well, I'd rather try something great and fail than not try anything. Um, so had he I done one at a time, he probably would have been better shape. Yeah, I think it's the nature of um, <clears throat> disruptors, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to disrupt, so you have to take it to the brink. And mm -hmm where traditional companies will uh, see that there's potential there, uh, you know, they're beholden to their, to their shareholders. And so they will be, uh, you know, there is no brinksmanship, right? You know, if you're a, uh, an internal startup, then, you know, you get X amount of dollars and you have to prove yourself. And then you go back to the well for more money and then you prove yourself again. And, mm -hmm. and so there's no real concept of brinksmanship, only risk management. Whereas Elon was willing to take his private for fortune and really literally more than once took it to the brink mm -hmm. and was you know, able to do incredible things because he was willing to get to that point where I got, I got nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. Either this works or I'm out of the space business. Either this works or we're out of the car business. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that mindset is, uh, you know, some, it's a lesson to learn uh, even within established companies. Uh, you know, Boeing's never gonna say, you know, either this launch works or we're out of the space business, right? Instead, mm -hmm. they're like, well, we'll invest a little bit more and we'll overcome these hurdles. 
And, you know, that's kind of the difference between uh, startups and, you know, multinational corporations that can fund things because there's a almost, you know, there's a term that, that is used and it's got, it's, it's, a, it's a misnomer, but uh, infinite cash, right? Mm-hmm. You throw out a problem and you're patient. And so you may not be the first one there, uh, but you will get there and you'll solve these problems. And, you know, back in the day when your only customer was the government, you know, there really wasn't a race. It was only a race to the contract. And then after that, you know, you innovated with your partner, with your customer, and it took as as long as it took to get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. I think that uh, cost plus contracting has has created a lot of bad habits um, because of of that. And then I think with the space station, there was an issue where they they were rushing because they wanted to catch up with the perceived level of progress by the partners and, and things like, well, if we don't get this done in time, then this other thing will file. So just do it, spend as much money as possible to get it done in two weeks and then tell me what it costs later. Um, you know, you're just asking for it then. Um, and, you know, if you, if you make something cost less money in a thing, in a business like that, you're actually going to get fired as well as to promote it. Uh, so there's a lot of perverse incentives in, in that, but it's like all things, it starts with the best of intentions during World War II, uh, because it was like, well, we can't just start a whole factory to build this thing. We need something to get started and then we can then we can move on. Um, but at some point you get past that point in terms of the industrial capacity of the country or the or the business. Um, you bring up a you indirectly brought up something of internal startups, and that's a that's a major um there's internal startups and then there's acquisitions. Um, Boeing has done a lot of acquisitions of small companies that were, they're, they're not necessarily going to become, they, it's not like they could be bought by Boeing or they would be the next Boeing in 15 years, although that might've been true. But um, those companies enjoy a bit of money and Boeing becomes essentially like a holding company. Um, I worked at Smith's group for a little while and they were a whole. They started out as doing instrumentation 100 years ago, and on, on cars and stuff like that. And now they're a holding company of like 400 completely disparate businesses, and they don't do their original business at all anymore. Um, but it was so one minute you're working on stuff that's like for air conditioning systems, and the next thing minute you're working on stuff for uh, offshore oil drilling rigs and so forth. It's rated at very high tolerances and so forth, and it was you know, will Boeing eventually end up there? I think it's kind of there in some ways already because they they assemble parts that, that have been done by uh, other companies. But, um, you know, one thing that, that if Blue Origin was serious, they would learn their own lesson from Amazon, which is Amazon has a thing where if you want to, you know, like the, the next generation of, of Kindle or whatever, they have, you can go to, if you're working at Amazon, you can write what's called a they, they have a policy of write a press release as if this, this product that you just thought of just came out and you're announcing it to the world, right? Like a two-page press release. And then they go through those and go, oh, this, if this came out, would I be excited about it? Yes or no? You know, imagine if Blue Origin had just 10 people and maybe a million dollars of all that factory space and all that saying, if I would for ideas for Orbital Re, for ideas for anything. And then they just ran a little innovation shop on the side you know, they would be doing something other than everybody just waiting for pieces of fiberglass to get rolled out the door year after year after year. Um, and it would probably invigorate the, the engineers there because they'd have a reason to be excited about life. So um, it would change the mindset of the company and the focus of the company in a way that really needs to happen. And it would be so cheap for them to do. And he already did it at Amazon because they had that, that idea comes straight out of Amazon. So, Ellen, you're waving your hand. I'm just going to wish you all a good week. And <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, Kent, we'll see you again. I would love to come back to this. Uh, like I said, I've got, if you want to just, uh, Svetlana, if you want to go through my thing and just go, oh, that's an interesting talk. You know, there's something I came up with was maybe we can, I'll just tease you with this, is, uh, you know, we talk about STEM a lot, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And it was like, 
that's great in education because I don't think I would have gotten into science if, if I realized that math was part of science as much as I did because I had a lot of math anxiety as a kid for reasons unrelated to my innovation. Um, eyesight was the problem. Um, but uh, that's great for education, but in the real world, math is, a, is the highest form of science and technology is really just instantiated engineering. So it's really just SE. And um, so I think we're, so I came up with something called CCADS, which was science engineering, um, convergence, uh, affordability, democratization and scale. And uh, so that ended up being a much broader spectrum of things that you could do uh, for application to innovation. So I think most people just dropped off. So I think, <laughs> I think it's just, but it uh, looks like it's still recording, so. No, uh, it, it, it's good. Yeah, so we, we're still okay. recording. I just, uh, I stopped you sharing. So instead oh, okay. of, so we can see bigger versions of us, all of oh, us. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm just looking at the, I, that's fine. I didn't realize I hadn't, I thought I did that. And I was like, okay. That's fine. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an idea. I was, uh, I did that last year of, it was that, part of a talk on, on solar sales and solar sales was the application of that methodology. But you get this kind of spark gap from it's an idea in a lab and then all of a sudden it jumps over to the, to the other end of the spectrum and then it becomes a real product. And it's interesting to see how those things happen. And what, what can you do to accelerate that process was another talk. So we could do that another time, I guess. Absolutely. That is an interesting topic and uh, definitely would be, uh, we'll address, we'll uh, look into it. I wanted to mention before other people drop that next uh, Saturday, we will have Artemis a team that will be coming with the presentation on Artemis mission planning. So please, if you are interested, join, or you can uh, watch a recorded session that we will post later. And a couple of things I wanted to bring up since uh, I love data and uh, you mentioned about 80-20 approach. There's a thing between uh, or the acceptability and acceptance. So those are, um, those are two different terms. And uh, one is that 80-20 is when you get the, the, the viable product. And the other one is... Um, uh, the, the number is 10% is that it's the acceptance by the general population. If you get, and that's where what Elon with electric cars, with Teslas, he, uh, his uh, goal was to get uh, to 10% of the population in, uh, in the United States. First, um, of course, the world would be uh, uh, even better. When uh, the electric cars no longer something novel that uh, everyone looks as a shiny object, it's mm -hmm. becoming more of the, the part of regular life. And uh, even those that for a long time that the hybrid was the gap between the regular combustion engine and uh, the, uh, the electric car when you're uh, afraid to have a range in anxiety, afraid to get off the grid and all of that, that the, the uh, having a hybrid type is, uh, is the gap in between. But now is a, it's, it's common for many uh, people to be accept, accept, open to the idea of having just electric car. So you're, you're no longer afraid that you will get stranded somewhere in the middle of um, a city or something. So yeah, that that ten percent is a uh, is another number that you may want to use in um, in in your presentations. Yeah, it's a there's a threshold at ten percent of the early adopters, which it, it becomes ten percent becomes the anchor for twenty percent, because then you get once you get the early adopters and so forth, and it's like okay, they're you know they they bit the flower and they didn't die of food poisoning, so maybe it's worth eating next, you know, tomorrow sort of thing, you know, to use the, use the cave analogy. But, um, you know, it's the 20% the is where things also get interesting is that I noticed when I was in college that I went to a college where 20% of the students were from Ohio. And 
the proportion of conversation about the subject of that which was in Ohio was way higher than it, you know, than it would have been if it had been 10% and it wasn't a popular topic or 30% and it was taken for granted. It was something about 20% where they just couldn't stop talking about it. And uh, if you see 20% of a population that is a minority, they suddenly just, there's like a whole ecosystem of, of an echo chamber around that, whatever they are, you know, their, their race or their creed or their religion or whatever, something about 20% or their philosophy or their, you know, you see it with computers where it was like when Apple was a certain percentage of the market, they just can't freaking stop talking about it when it's 20%. And I don't know what it is. There's something about it. It's like, it's like a, it's just safe enough a topic that they can talk about it. And it's just not safe enough that they consider it novel or something. There's something about, about that, that I think accelerates things into, into mainstream um, because 20% is typically a, a, a factor right around there. But a lot of things get stuck at 20% uh, because you can get 20% of a population on any particular um, bandwidth, it seems like. There's, there's something there, especially in politics, uh, where there's 20% believe X and it's never higher or lower than that. So um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of psychology there, I think, one way or another on openness and acceptance of, of mentalities and how they, how they figure into the population. But yeah, 10% to 20%, I never really thought about that in that, those terms, that there's something, there's something magical about 10% as well. Because the, the diffusive innovation curve is 20, 40, 60, 80. So 10 is, is uh, yeah, I'll look into that. OK, well, thank you. Any other questions? And I will stop recording. Thank you so much for presentation. This was great. And I'm looking forward to our future 